Every time I go on the internet and I go to one form of video sharing, I see nothing but ads. And this morning, I watched in my amazement is I watched a guy that was absolutely attempting to commit fraud. And what he was saying was outlandish. His claims were well beyond what would be considered reasonable. And I'm going to talk about that right here on the Insecurity This Brief. is the Insecurity Brief podcast. It features tech news and analysis throughout the world. This podcast is made possible through advertising and listeners like you. We need your help. Please subscribe. We know you are out there. If you can't donate, please share this program. We, we depend, depend on, on you. you. So when you go on the internet and you look at all these things and you see these con men and it's con man after con man after con man and then you go on, you know, it, there's a game that I, that I play and, you know, it feeds off of uh, Facebook. So Facebook's posting this stuff and it, it you know, it, the thing is there's a long history with these companies, all of the media companies that are on the internet of selling to thieves. And this is something that we've gotten pretty much used to. We've been desensitized by thievery. And you know, it, it, it's not just the Nigerian scammers through our emails, but I'm talking about these guys that actually pay, pay money to, for display ads and pay money to put videos up that are trying to get illicit criminal activity. Now, I understand that there's a lot of people that believe, you know, in the platforms and they're held harmless for everything, um, for Section 230. And we hear that thrown around all over the place. But you may not understand exactly what 230 is. It's not a complete catch-all like is been put on the news and the definition and what is gone on on the internet. I mean, right now, Facebook's in a lot of heat because of um, what it's done. Uh, it is propagated a whole bunch of horrors, uh, its company and some of its divisions, what it's done to adolescents, um, is horrific. You know, I, I wrote a book called Protecting Kids Online, and some of it, uh, I, you know, I, I thought about this a lot of what the harms are to our young and in social media. But when we're talking about 230, you got to go back to what it was written for and why it was actually written. Because what had happened at the time was the internet was a lot younger then. Uh, there wasn't near the amount of identity theft because the data brokers didn't get emboldened as well. And that is another consequence of 230. All of these companies that steal private information and put it online to tease and say that they're going to sell it. They'll sell your home address or they'll sell who you work with or they sell just about every aspect of your life. This is also covered under 230 and that specifically really is covered under 230. But this other stuff of criminality isn't. It's just that there's no there's no want to, by our Justice Department, 
to actually enforce the law in this. So at the beginning of 230, what that was really about, it was originally passed as the Internet Decency Act. What had happened the prior years before it was written, uh, and I, I say that prior years because this was an ongoing problem, is that there were a group of uh, porn operators that were buying the domain names of just about everything that was hot on the internet at that time, and there wasn't really that much that was hot. Um, they would buy the misspellings of Yahoo and, I mean, double O's or zero zero instead of, you know, hitting the zero key. They were, they bought just about every one of those. And then what would happen is you would open up a web page and that web page would have a pop up and another one and another one and another one. A lot of them were basically porn, and uh, there was one group that was causing most of this out of Florida, and um, they they were just purveyors. I mean, just about everywhere you went on the internet, if you hit the wrong key, you'd end up popping open a porn site, uh, or at least it looked like a porn site, but it wasn't really a single porn site. It was a redirection from stuff long ago. So what happened was the uh, web browsers at the time, I think that uh, Mozilla and uh, Firefox and the um, and uh, Microsoft's uh, web browser uh, were present and there was something else too. I don't even remember what it was. Uh, that were the top web browsers at the time. At first, there were plugins to to block pop-ups, and then eventually, it got written into the code of the web browser. Um, Google wasn't really a player yet, uh, by the way, and that's why I didn't even mention them. Um, so what happened was fixed, uh, for the most part, and then Congress acted, which if you were in the computer industry, you just thought that was really funny that Congress uh, was going, was acting, and they wrote this decency act to, and, and no other country has this. Um, no other country would attempt to have this because no other country has the undue influence of corporate power in its legislative bodies. I mean, to the degree that we do. And what they did by enacting this, uh, what they did by enacting this law was twofold. One, they made it so that the carriers, the ISPs, could actually censor um, censor speech, and uh, by kicking anyone off that they wanted to kick off of their platform and be held harmless. It was really a. It wasn't about free speech at all, it was more or less um, giving corporate corporations power over people in the respect of the law being passed. And what it ended up doing was causing the large corporate sense, uh, social media platforms to be emboldened. I mean, one of the things, and it, this is because of the way that the law was written, is that, and no other country has this, that actually made it possible for Twitter to, as a social platform, to actually exist. Of course, it was also 
the booming of the internet that spread like lightning across the Middle East that threw it in complete turmoil because now there was a communication base and there were apps that allowed people to actually send messages to each other and uh, to the chagrin of dictators um, they one by one got overthrown because of it Arab Spring uh, that you may have heard of I believe had Twitter had a good part in that um, just like the uh, things going on you know Facebook got its front and center with uh, with the mass killing stuff um, put the video click the video on and do a live feed so we saw and and this this stuff protected Twitter and protected Facebook because the content um, was disturbing at the same time it protected the companies but it wasn't being promoted by the companies and this is where the line gets split because when a criminal buys someone buys or rents advertising space and they put it on the platform to be consumed and be tricked then they're culpable of a crime and it's not just the crime of the the person that's perpetrating it it's also part of the platform they are partners in that I'm not a legal scholar or anything, but I do realize that when somebody is perpetrating a, a crime by doing a con and offering a con, and what, specifically what I'm talking about is I saw this, this guy that shot a video in what looked like a warehouse, and he had this sign in the back of him that was printed on a piece of cardboard that he said was the name of this company and they invited him to sh there to show that he was had a system of making three thousand dollars a day uh not stocking anything just doing affiliate marketing and the things that you could sell for affiliate marketing I saw this crap with funnels before um, people selling funnels literally the whole object of selling a funnel is to sell how to sell a funnel that is the funnel platform and people paid for this crap and you know anybody that knew what the hell this was knew that this was a crime you know you can't do that you can't perpetrate oh yeah you can you can apparently on social media you can perpetrate crimes and you and have idiots proclaim that oh it's not illegal because of 230 230 uh no provider um under civil liability let's go back to one Section C, protection for Good Samaritan, blocking and screening of offensive material. One, treatment of publisher or speaker. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or a speaker of any information provided by another content provider. Interesting, because when you rent space you become part of it it's not the same thing as holding harmless and you know civil liability no provider or user of interactive computer service shall be held liable on the account of any action voluntary taken in good faith to restrict access or availability of material of the provider or consideration of considers to be obscene, lewd, or lifticious. 
filthy, excessive, violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not the material is constitutionally protected or any action taken to enable or make available the information content providers or other technical means to restrict access to material described in paragraph one. So this is what the words say. It doesn't say anything about um, a criminal. It says something about basically what porn is. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, Facebook is looking to get 230 rewritten so that they can be effectively regulated. And how do we regulate how do we regulate speech? And should speech be regulated? These questions, you know, I, I was watching a news program earlier and they were calling this supposedly on the right was calling for regulation of social media. And social media, because it's a silo, is the problem. It's a real problem. There's another platform out there, and I've really been looking at it, and I haven't done anything yet. But there's a, a platform out there that is called Mastodon. And Mastodon is a, is a platform that was created by, I can't remember the guy's name now. He got mad at Twitter a long time ago and copied their platform and made it so that you can't get thrown off the platform. Right now, what we're living in is a nightmare of silos, meaning that you go onto a platform and it's not so you go onto a platform like Facebook. If you go onto Facebook, you have to have an account on Facebook to see anything. And this is true on LinkedIn as well. You don't really see anything unless you're logged into the system. Twitter on the opposite side is completely open. I love these people that t say to block somebody on face on Twitter because if you block them, it doesn't really matter. You just open a web any other web browser you're not logged into and you can see whatever the hell you want. Except with a couple um a couple exceptions but for the most part you can um so it's just silly at that point but what i'm getting at with the silos is that your account information is only good inside that thing within mastodon it has it's built on a different communication platform and to send a message it uses a different set of rules. So one example of this is that you could send a message from your messages on Twitter. And if I'm not, let's say the other person is on Facebook and I send the message, it ends up on their messenger on Facebook. And when they respond in time, I get it back on Twitter. I mean, it doesn't work like that now because these platforms are built as a silo, literally with walls around them that don't allow the sharing of information. I mean, there are things that will allow you to cross-publish, but those don't those are useless really at this point. Facebook has got its AI tuned down so far that if you just try to post something and then leave, nobody will see it. Um, you need to interact on the system and the AI watches your interaction and make sure that you're there. Then you can post something and you got to hang out for a while for and uh interact some more after that post and as soon as you leave the interaction stops on the post or something like that uh, it'll live for a little bit longer if after an amount of time of interacting and I don't remember what the stats were 
Twitter, at least, you don't have to have that. Um, you got to have a following and be interesting because, um, truthfully, most of the people that get mad at social media that come up with something, it really isn't interesting. And the reason that it doesn't get shared isn't because you don't have enough followers. It's because it's really not that interesting. Nobody finds it funny or whatever. And there it sits. And that's true on all forms of media. Um, it's a hard lesson to learn to be relevant, but the idea that these companies can throw somebody off and block ideas and block, um, actually, actually do censorship through omission, um, not necessary, and you know, it, it's not all right. Anyway, listen, I depressing stuff. I promise it's going to be funny next time. Anyway, I, I'm Trip. <laughs>